Let us do it, yeah. <coughs> All right. Yeah, well, that's awesome. I think it looks fine. Okay. Yeah. Is this on? This is on. Yeah. This is on? This is on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta make sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel that. I feel that. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Compelling Conversations podcast. Today, I'm really excited to be joined by Brooks. Brooks, thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Knocking the recording materials down. Yeah, there you go. Thanks again for being here, man. Yeah. Had an awesome conversation a couple months ago, but mm. it is what it is, right? Now we're yeah. here. Yeah, here again. Yeah. I wanted to begin, Brooks, by something you told me recently, which I thought was pretty profound. What you intended for evil, God intended for good, so that many might be saved. Genesis fifty twenty. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Yeah, we were, you know, just talking about the um, the idea of God's control like how he's actually able to be in control of things plus our responsibility in that and the complications that brings right so that's just kind of the idea that um how can there be this all-powerful all-knowing even all good god and yet there is uh evil you know in the world um and so that verse is the very very end of genesis uh in the old testament um or what some call the hebrew bible And uh, you have the life uh, account of Joseph. And what ends up happening in this account is that Joseph's brothers become very jealous of uh, Joseph's um, favorite status for their father. At least in in Genesis, it describes Jacob, uh, their father, as overvaluing Joseph at the expense of his brothers, um, giving him special clothing and all kinds of things because he's uh, seen as better you know than them and so they in in jealousy and anger uh over this say you know we need to get rid of him and do away with him and they sell him into slavery um with the hopes that he would die uh one day someday and um basically as time goes on he ends up uh making his way to egypt um and then through god's care providence all this stuff and joseph's response to that through dreams um, he ends up just getting a ton of um, clout in Egypt, <laughs> you could say, uh, and power. You know, he's pretty, he has status now. And um, at that time as well. So he, he basically get these indications through these, these dreams that he has that there's going to be a famine to come. And so he advises the Egyptians, we need to gather up as much grain as possible while we have these good seasons because one day a famine's coming when we won't. And so that's what they do. And um, soon the famine comes. And then now his family over in kind of proto-Israel, um, but his family, um, they end up being in need of food. And so they come now to their brother, who they don't recognize because it's been 20 years down the road. Um, and they're seeking grain. And so through these conversations they have, they eventually realize this is our brother that we sold into slavery. And yet now he's actually helping us, which would not have been possible had we not saved, sold him into slavery. So their evil act is the thing that ends up saving their family. Uh, had they not done this, they would have starved to death. And so his comment to them, which summarizes the book of Genesis at the end is, you know, what you intended for evil God intended for good so that many might be saved. And so this whole theme is just woven throughout the Bible in the Old Testament, but then in the New as well, um, that God is actually capable of doing that, you know, using the evil that we do um, for his good purposes. It's not to say that God's evil. It's not to say that he's even okay with evil, But to a certain extent, um, if he's bringing a greater good out of it, uh, it's um, mysteriously justifiable for God to do it and to work this way. It's the threat of destiny, eh? Yeah, yeah. But it is. It's an amazing. It's an amazing line. I mean, I think it's and it makes sense. It really is. Yeah, it's a cool one. But it's um, yeah, it's powerful for sure. Um, And even though it causes like a bunch of questions and problems for many of us. And there's mystery to it. I think that um, 
if that's true, if that's a true understanding of God, that actually it greatly helps to have this understanding that um, even the greatest acts of evil uh, can be used in God's timing and way to bring about a good that you would never even be able to conceive. Um, doesn't make the evil good. It just means that evil actually is not going to be the thing that um, wins in the end. Yeah. I like that song in Prince of Egypt, you know, Through Heaven's Eyes. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but yeah. it talks about that, you know? It's like, life's a tapestry, and mm. you just don't know where you're being woven for what mm-hmm. purposes either, you mm-hmm. know? This is a bit of a random switch, but it's been something that I've been very curious about for a minute now. Is there salvation for Judas? Mm. What is his confrontation with Christ like on Judgment Day? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, Judas is described I'm trying to think of the exact uh, accounts because Jesus mentions some things about him but I don't know if he mentions in the in the in the gospel accounts at least that are given I can't remember off the top of my head if he mentions um, Judas's destiny or, or what else whatever else it might be Um I think he does and then Paul mentions some things as well there's not much that's given and the way in which he is recorded as dying um, although that doesn't necessarily whenever someone's recorded as dying in the Bible that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that we know you know their their fate you know their judgment um, before God but there still are indications, possibly, that the way that they die is, is that it, it points to possibly what will... It would be kind of like an idea would be a, um, a future judgment is being tasted in part now, mm. uh, but not in full, right? So, um, yeah, it does, it does appear in the Bible that he will be judged by God. But we don't know what that confrontation is like. Yeah, I guess not. I mean, you know, there's not, I mean, there's nothing that says specifically this is what will happen mm. to Judas. No. Interesting. No. But I mean, if you infer everything else is in the Bible, um, what's indicated is that he's going to receive judgment. He's going to receive God's wrath. God's, mm. you know, there's labels for this hell, judgment, God's wrath, um, just payment for sin. Um yeah. Did Paul know Judas or no? To our indications, I mean, we don't really know. Um, but, I mean, no, that, that's never mentioned, no. Um, but Paul was a, uh, yeah, the Apostle Paul who was named Saul definitely was alive around the time of Jesus. Yeah. So he very well could have. Um, but, I mean, depending upon where Paul lived and how he interacted with them, I'm not really sure. Um because uh, the account of his life really starts to begin not long after um, Jesus's, uh, I do think he was crucified, right? But it's supposed crucifixion, uh, crucifixion resurrection. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, not very long after that. So um, he very well could have met these people. Um, it do, I will say this, it does seem from, so most of this information comes from a book called Acts in the New Testament. Um, I highly recommend uh, reading that book for anybody, whether they're a Christian or not, partly because um, it is written as a a historical account of the beginning of the Christian movement of the Christian church. Um, I'm trying to think of like an uh, an equivalent, uh, like a Muslim equivalent of this, Um, you know, possibly like Ibn Ishaq or something like that, like a biography, but um, this would be a little more... um, broad and comprehensive in the sense of um, it's really providing a ton of historical data and then you can actually test that which is fascinating like a lot of people have done this whether they be historians or archaeologists or whatever Um, and uh, it by and large it actually comes out to be an extremely reliable document now there's going to be theological elements in it too that can't be verified from just strict historical archaeological scrutiny but it's it's just a great book um and so when we see paul come onto the scene it seems very clear that he knew a good bit about this jesus movement you know whatever it wasn't called christianity um 
but about these people that were yeah, what, uh, claiming things what, about Jesus. What would Jesus. it have been called? Do you know? Yeah, to our, to our knowledge in Acts, it says this, that Christians were first called Christians at Antioch. So at Antioch, that's when they were called Christians. When and is that? When? Yeah, um, off the top of my head. So the book of Acts is recording a time period from about 30-ish AD to about 65 AD, so about a 35-year period. Um, I believe off the top of my head that would have been about 10 years later. Mm. So it would have been somewhere in like the early 40s. Um, and uh, yeah, they were called Christians. Christians also, to, to our best knowledge, it sort of is a pejorative term. It's like, oh. it's, it's sort of like saying little Christs. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, it doesn't have to mean like, it doesn't have to be negative, but it does seem to be like a, um, it's a term that was used of Christians by non-Christian people. Um, you know, these, these are the people that follow this person called Christ, yeah. you know, so. Christos is Greek, so mm-hmm. did yeah. Jesus ever, was he ever referred to as Christ in his life? Yeah, I think so, because, yeah, you're right, so, yeah, uh, yeah, Christus would be Greek, um, it would mean Messiah, um, you know, uh, Mashiach would be, like, the Hebrew you know, variant of it, or version of it, um, but because uh, many, many people in the Greco-Roman world, but specifically in uh, Israel, because they had so many touch points with different people in that area, they, many were fluent in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. Um, Greek would have been the common language of that whole region. So like, if you wanted to uh, have any ability to be able to engage in trade or commerce, you had to know Greek. Um, but then as a Jew, you would have definitely known Aramaic and Hebrew. Aramaic just being a dialect of Hebrew, very, very, very similar, but slightly different. Um, so yes, yeah, he very well would have been called that even by Jewish people. Now they would have preferred to refer to him in their own tongue, Hebrew, and then the, the offshoot of that Aramaic, but yeah, they very well could have used Greek as well. Like for example, um, the person, uh, Peter, um, his first, his, his name is actually Simon, but Simon's a Jewish name. Peter's a Greek name. Interesting. So Simon, to our best knowledge, because uh, this is kind of cool, historians have like gathered up as many documents as we can find from that era. And if you uh, say you gather up um, uh, documents from Palestine, from the ancient Near East and that, that area, from say 200 BC to 280, so like from a 400 year period, and the, you know computers now, you can do like a statistical analysis of names of people that are listed. I mean, in any, any document you can think of, receipts from like grocery transactions uh, up to, yeah, like a biography of Jesus, which is what we think of as the Gospels. Any document there is, you can actually find the um, uh, popularity of names that are given. So to our best knowledge, Simon is the most popular male name for a couple of hundred years. And this happens all over the place, right? Your name's Omer, like very popular name. Um, Brooks is not a very popular name, right? It's an interesting name. It's an interesting name. It comes from like, what you you told me about this. Blessings, yeah. Yeah. And there's like an Arabic for it as well, Baraka, right? Yeah, that's right. And then, yeah, and it would be Barak or Barak in in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then Baruchs would be the plural form of it. Baruchs. Baruchs, Brooks, yeah. So, I mean, this would have been when Jews traveled to, like, England. So this is, like, an English version of it. But, um, yeah, so, the, yeah, very common name. So the, when, since Simon is such a common name, you had to disambiguate that name is what it's mm. called. So you had to make it not ambiguous. Ambiguous being we don't know what it is, right? Which Simon are we talking about? There's so many Simons. Oh, okay. So you have to give a... Well, no, it's Simon from this area, or like there's Simon the Tanner because he worked with leather, or Simon the um, Simon son of Cyrene. You know, there's all these different things. You know, so Simon yeah. Peter. So it would be like the way to distinguish which Simon are we talking about? Oh, it's Simon who's called the Rock, which is what the Greek word Peter means. So um, that uh, that's a long way of just saying that's proof positive that even um, Jews still had close attachment to Greek. You know, it was his name Barabbas, the guy that they, uh, they freed. Mm-hmm. Is there salvation for Barabbas? Yeah, uh, I don't know. We don't know anything else about him. Just because that he's, he was freed. Yeah, yeah, he would be in the gospel accounts. There's a man named Barabbas that's freed, uh, who's a criminal who is freed 
in the place of Jesus during his trial and execution. But yeah, what's um, what's said of him and his life thereafter, we don't have any account. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, something you mentioned earlier. In the Muslim tradition, that idea also exists that unless someone is deliberately condemned to hell like the pharaoh of uh-huh. Moses' time, yeah. then we know that they're going to hell. Right. But if it's not mentioned, we yeah. can't say, right. which I think is fascinating. Another thing I wanted to discuss with you is I'm really interested in the concept of the wolf. In the Quran, the wolf is mentioned three times, mm. if I'm not mistaken, all in the times of the story of Joseph. Mm. Do you know any significant places that the wolf is mentioned yeah. in the biblical tradition? In animals and stuff. Yeah, I mean, animals are used to depict, typically animals are used to depict um, nation states and powers against God and against God's people in the in the biblical documents. Um, <clears throat> so is a wolf mentioned in the account of Joseph's life? No, I don't think so. Um off the top of my head, but uh yes, um lions, wolves, bears, leopards hmm. are mentioned in various prophet books, prophetical books. Um like Daniel, Ezekiel, uh, Jeremiah um, and then those things are also repeated in New Testament works um, particularly Revelation so this would be what Christians consider the final book of of the Bible um, but the, yeah those same images are used but yes they tend to, they tend to be used to describe like I said people and or nations that are against God and against God's people Interesting. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, there's times where, like, maybe historically you could line up some of those animals with actual people groups. Like Daniel, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is about as close as we can do that with. It does seem like he is making predictions about certain nations, namely Babylon, Assyria, um, the Greeks, and then the Romans. Persia is in there as well Hmm. but those animals actually would be pairing up with the events of those nations overtaking the Jews in succession as they kind of gained power Hmm. because first like Assyria was the world power in that time and then they got replaced by Babylon and then they got replaced by Persia who then got replaced by Alexander the Great the Greeks and they got replaced by the Romans Um, that is very interesting mm -hmm. lineage there yeah up to the, the time of Jesus, the Romans ruled. I'm curious mm-hmm. about the, the wolf in particular because I think it's interesting in the Muslim tradition when the brothers, when they come back to Jacob, mm-hmm. they're like, hey, like, sorry, Dad, like a wolf ate him. Mm. That's what he predicted would happen, right? Or he, what he was afraid of. And Jacob says to them, like, no, I just don't believe you. That just can't mm. happen. Yeah. And I think this is so fascinating because... In Norse mythology, the wolf is a symbol of fate. Hmm. And the wolf... Like inescapable, yeah. Yeah, he devours Odin. Hmm. That's the death of Odin, Hmm. the wolf. And so it's very interesting to me. I know these are very different traditions. Sure, but but that's even used, yeah. That parallel between, like, Jacob just saying, like, no, fate cannot eat Hmm. Joseph. Mm -hmm. He's still out there. There's got to be good Hmm. out there. So I just think it's a very interesting concept. It is. So the wolf, Dib in Arabic, it's, uh, it's something fascinating. And this is in the surah about Joseph? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah, it's, it's something to mm-hmm. think about for sure. But um, something that we talked about the first time we did this, but we weren't able to record, Cain. Yeah. I was Bring really fascinated Cain. in the story <laughs> of Cain. And actually, yeah. I think one of the most powerful lessons that I've learned in a minute was from you. It was about how... The sin of Cain is neglect, mm-hmm. neglecting others and neglecting yourself, which yeah. is insane. Uh huh. What do you make of that? Yeah, yeah. So, to to keep it short, or try to, uh, <laughs> I'm sometimes long winded. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, the way so Genesis early on. This is in Genesis four, but um, the account of Cain and Abel's life is given, and so you have 
uh, Cain being the um, the brother of Abel. Uh, and there's uh, Abel. They actually both uh, are depicted as giving um, sacrifices of you know honor and worship to God. And uh, Abel's sacrifice is like the best of his flock, um, an animal. Whereas Cain's sacrifice is some fruit. Now, it, what is implied there is that basically Cain is being a little stingy with God. Abel is, is more willing, at least, to sacrifice more um, for the sake of worshiping God. Um, I don't think that necessarily means, though, that Cain is unacceptable and Abel is acceptable because of that. But I think what you're supposed to see is that there really is a difference between the two of them. Now, the key difference starts coming out thereafter where Cain then becomes jealous of Abel, his brother. He doesn't like the fact that um, Abel's sacrifice is different at all. And so God then speaks to uh, Cain and says, hey, be careful. Um, sin is crouching at your door. And even the, the verb that's used there in Hebrew implies like an animal trying to overtake you. Sin is crouching at your door. Don't let it overtake you. Overtake it, basically, is what he says. And... Um, Cain then does not do that, and then the the Genesis account says that he kills his brother Abel, um, and then God approaches him and says, you know, where's your brother? So interesting, and at least in the Bible, uh, the way in which God is depicted interacting with people is that he is very relational. Of course, the God of the universe knows where Abel is, but he's still asking the question because he wants to relate, you know, to Cain. He says, you know, Cain's response is, am I my, am I my brother's keeper? Keeper uh, in Hebrew meaning protector, garter, you know, uh, and um, kind of a sassy response. <laughs> my, I just killed my brother. and Oh, yeah, am, am I supposed to protect my brother? Yes, is the actual answer. Um, God says, you know, you've murdered your brother. You've done something horrible. Um, however, um, he does say, I'm sending you away now. Um, but I'm going to put a mark on you. We don't know what that is, but a mark was apparently put on him so that others would not retaliate. Um, th- there seems to be this desire that even if you do something horrible, something evil, something wicked, um, that there would not be almost like um, gang retaliation <laughs> um, in its place. And so it says from there that he goes to the east marry someone there and starts a family um but he kind of leaves god's presence yeah you know, even though god can be present anywhere i was curious like in the muslim tradition what his fate would be and when i asked sheikh Omar, it was interesting sheikh Omar told me we don't know yeah but we do know you said the mark of cain i don't know if we necessarily had the idea of a mark of cain but what's said is that for every human being on earth that murders someone yeah some bit of that sin goes to him mm-hmm. which i thought was just so interesting sure Scary yeah and, too, eh? it is yeah and i mean and, and to your point when you mentioned that um saying what's representative of of cain is this uh lack of love toward a brother particularly other people in general yeah the the um new testament writings uh first john so one of jesus's followers john writes this little letter um and he uses cain as kind of like a uh a case study or an example of what the lack of neighbor love looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, he's saying that's actually the that that uh, the way Cain treated his brother is actually characteristic of this world. The way the way the world works in an evil way, in a fallen way, um, is I want to delete you from my life. Uh, when you get in my way, I want you gone. I want to cancel you. I want to be done with you, whether that's literally or figuratively. Um, it comes from the same heart. Um, and so John's, at least, argument there is you're not in the way of Cain. <laughs> you're actually meant to um, live and, and live after and model something different, especially because Christians believe that um, Jesus, uh, being God, actually is somebody who... Um, stoops to the lowest level to be able to lose his own life so that we wouldn't lose it 
So if that's true of what he's done, why should, why should I take anyone's life? You know, if I've received something from God that's that precious, why would I take that from other people? Why would I delete yeah. them from my life? And so that's at least the operating ethic of John, yeah. right? Cain is doing kind of like an anti-God thing and, and really, from a Christian perspective, an anti-Jesus thing. And he's saying, no, love people deeply. When you see they have needs, care for them, give to them, do the anti Cain. <laughs> it's so interesting you mentioned the betrayal of the world and how that is connected. Yeah. That's just so fascinating. And it is true of our world. I mean, right, regardless it of is. what someone thinks about Christianity or not, it is true like that the world operates that way. Yeah. This is something I've been thinking about as well. Um, music. Mm. I'm not personally right like I, I feel like I'm not convinced that music is necessarily a good thing mm-hmm. it's just everywhere mm-hmm. and I f- Russell Brand in his book Recovery Freedom from Our Addictions he talks about how our ego it does us wrong does mm-hmm. us dirty and then it throws us into the wilderness mm. and so now we're in the wilderness we're like really sad we're sitting there with all these broken pieces but we decide to you know, align ourselves with the higher power, mm-hmm. God. Mm-hmm. We decide to love others, be in their service, right? We decide to get our act together. Yeah. But then what happens is now we're feeling better, and then the ego comes in again. Yes. I and think he's right about that. it fools us. Uh-huh. It hoodwinks us. It takes the credit, like, oh, you're feeling good because of me. Yeah. yeah. And then it throws us back into the book, <laughs> which is crazy. Yes. And so with music, especially recently, um, I've just been feeling that. Like, when I disassociate myself from music I feel a lot better you know Mm. it's like okay now I can like pick myself up again and now I'm feeling good it's like oh time to play a song that I love and then I start listening to all these songs and these kind of steal the soul and then throw me back into the wilderness so I'm curious like like betrayal of the world that's what it is eh and Mm. everything in it and where does music play a role in the Christian tradition yeah it's a great question you know, it made me think, I remember when I ran into you in the student center too, we, like uh, the Russell Brand thing you just shared, his, his quote or his paraphrase reminded me of that C.S. Lewis quote, a uh, Christian theologian from the, the 20th century. He said that technically speaking, he doesn't think there could be a humble person on the earth because the second that person became humble, they would become prideful about their humility. Yeah. <laughs> They'd yeah. be like, oh, I'm humble. Yeah. I feel good about that. Oh, yeah. man, you know, it's gone now, yeah. so now I'm not humble. Um, it's just inescapable. Uh, and, th- and I think Brand is right about that, that your ego um, quickly comes in to kind of take that away. Yeah, what what is the Christian view of, of music? Because, um, like, songs are important, right, in the Christian tradition? I've always so. been curious about that. Both, both in Judaism and Christianity. Where yeah. does that come from? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. So, the, yeah, the way – so, funny enough, so in the um, – in the Old Testament, I mean, there is a whole book called Psalms, uh, which is, um, it is 150 songs. Um, David's, is right? what they are. Uh, many of them are attributed to David, but not all. No. Um, I'd probably say, I mean, over, over half. I mean, at least uh, probably roughly two-thirds of them. Um, some of them are not attributed to anybody. Um, one is attributed to Moses. Maybe a couple, might be like two, are attributed to Solomon, David's son. Uh, there's a few that are attributed to these, um, to a guy named Asaph, who would have been like a music composer um, in and around the time of David. And then the sons of Korah, who would have been a group of people, like wow. basically like a group of musicians. That is interesting. Yeah. Sons of Korah. Sons of Korah with of all a K. people. Wow. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, right. Um, and so. Uh, yeah, there's 150 of them, and so music is actually seen as positive. It's seen as something that, um, you know, is uh, meant to do something that prose alone cannot do. So music is, is kind of a more full-bodied uh, engagement of the mind, the emotions, the will um, that uh, sometimes prose can't accomplish, right? Um, but, like, in the Christian tradition, like when Christ, say, was having a service, mm-hmm. would they be singing? Or what, what is that? What was his relationship like? Yeah, I mean, it, it's so because he is a Jew um, and he's taking these these Old Testament uh, t- 
texts and applying them and living them out. Yes, yeah, they would have been singing. I mean, and we we see this even in the gospel. So in his last uh, meal with his disciples, commonly called the Passover meal, um, which is what they would eat once a year, commemorating their their release from Egypt, from slavery. Uh, It says that they uh, sang one of their favorite hymns um, at the end of that. So singing uh, instruments, dance, was actually very built into um, the Jewish tradition, lifestyle, culture, whether that be on a weekly basis, in um, celebratory basis for festivals and celebrations and times to stop, to cease and to rest. Um, that is carried over into the Christian tradition completely, yeah. Um, I mean, Paul, in some of his letters, he's even telling these Christian communities, you know, not only to devote themselves to the Bible, but to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, you know, uh, doing this with thankfulness in your hearts to God, and making melody to God with everything you have, and so on and so forth. You see, and you see examples of this in the Old Testament as well. Um, that's not to say that, by the way, I mean, I want to move a little bit toward your direction. I think any good thing in the way that the world is can be used for a bad thing. Yeah. And to the degree that that good thing actually has power, the more powerfully bad it can be. So, for example, yeah, like a, a shovel yes. is great for digging holes. I, I can also use it to kill somebody. Um fire is great keeps us warm it cooks stuff right it can also burn buildings down nuclear power is awesome and it's clean (laughs) i'm not making a you know (laughs) we should go nuclear i mean maybe you know but like it also is terrible if it explodes right so and that's to the degree that that something is powerfully good it has a powerful bad i think music actually has Is the camera done Uh uh-oh i don't know (laughs) Just noticed. Did I check? <laughs> yeah, check it for us. <laughs> Did it die? Let's see. It's like if you don't touch it for long enough, maybe it die. I just noticed that. No, you're good. You're good. You can keep recording. Maybe it. No, maybe just. I, maybe it was. It's fine. Maybe. Maybe you just go dark for a little bit. For a little bit. Recording keeps yeah, happening. There you, you go. can just like edit yeah. that in. <laughs> I don't think it was all that long, anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah, so I think, I think music is powerful, and I think it actually is inherently good, but just like any good and powerful thing can be used for bad. Interestingly enough, I will say this, back to the Cain thing, right after uh, Cain's account is given, um, technically, one, it's like the second song, you could say, that's sung, uh, at least recorded in the Bible. The first one is... Um, Adam singing this kind of like couplet, a little poetic couplet when he sees Eve for the first time. He oh, says, really? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Um, you know, uh, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and so on and so forth. They'll become one flesh. Like it's, hmm. he is saying something poetically about this woman that he's about to marry. That's a good song, if you will, a poem, very whatever. But the but the second one that's recorded is after Cain's killing of his brother and his dismissal by God, his banishment by God, and it describes uh, basically culture beginning to form on the earth amongst people, um, metal workers and woodworkers and so on and so forth. But then it also mentions uh, people that make musical instruments, and this leader named Lamech. Um, ends up uh, killing somebody and gloating about it in a song. Um, and there's almost like a, a song that's given. It's like, um, you know, I don't know. I can't really remember. But like somebody somebody killed, you know, seven people, but Lamet, Lamet kills 70 people. It's something like that. He's basically like gloating about his ability to be able to outdo you in his violence. And so it's what you're supposed to see is that like, the world is becoming more and more violent at this time. Oh. Um, but a song is recorded, is my point. My point, though, there is that you have a good song and you have a bad song. You yeah. have good content and you have bad content um, that very well can uh, can happen for all of us. So. No, it's, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Yeah. Part of the reason that I was thinking the way I was was because, you know, Chris Cornell is my favorite musician. Mm-hmm. And you just hear those songs and, like, they're so beautiful they're so powerful especially you know lyrically instrumentally but then it's like 
you know, figuratively speaking, like, there's so many of these people that swallow their spears, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Like, you just, you either die in it or you walk away from it. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's, like, a, I don't know, it's just something I've been thinking sure. about, about it. Yeah, and there's sort of, like, a chicken and egg going on there, too, right? It's like, did someone like Chris Cornell, did he um, make the decisions he made toward the end? Was that because of his music? Or did his music flow from the angst and the pain and, and the suffering that was already there, you know, within him? This is um, actually very and that's good hard to know, right? Because, you know, which one influences um, what? Yes, sir, I didn't mean to talk over You're you, okay. but with this whole conversation we've been having, it's something like that where art in general, right, creativity, like these sorts of things, I feel more and more like they're like the world, like they betray you. Mm-hmm. You know, they take the credit to make you feel good, or well, when you feel good, mm-hmm. but they betray you. Mm-hmm. And then you're just kind of stuck there, like, wow, well, you know, I created all this or I did all that, but you feel betrayed. Mm-hmm. Right? So, just something I've been thinking about. Yeah. They... Also, I don't know if I, those are the most accurate words to people that swallow their spears. I'm not sure that's the most accurate yeah language. but yeah I think it can be sometimes yeah I mean I, I think with, with art again I mean I think it's sort of like um, art both flows from us and shapes us and so there is this you know cycle that's happening culturally for us but I do think that art yes it, it can um, it's off again Sina uh, <laughs> I don't know maybe it's not wanting to stay for us was it recording? It was recording. Is it dying? I just can't tell. I can't tell either. Okay, well, we're back on We'll again. see, yeah. Um, I would say that art, um, art, art seems to be, um, so it, yeah, if, if, if all people, um, have good and bad, <laughs> um, the biblical way of understanding this is that everybody's made in God's image and yet we're all also sinful or put another way, we're all cracked, we're all broken. <laughs> um, if I dropped my phone right now, like it would still function as a phone. It would still function as Steve Jobs intended it to, its creator. Um, yet it still wouldn't function fully because it's cracked now, right? I, I think that's similar to the way we are is that we still are... Um, extremely valuable uh, extremely amazing in what we can do and yet we're all still kind of cracked there's stuff about us that just isn't right um, which makes sense uh, for me at least why art has like a two pronged aspect to it because when it comes out of us or the, whoever creates it um, there can be some really like beautiful but also broken things that come out of that um, I'll never forget, like, growing up being so drawn to, like, superhero stuff and superhero shows and movies and and things. Um, But, uh... (laughs) Yeah. No, you can keep going. The video keeps dying. Um, I don't know what what that's about. But, yeah, I was always drawn to the superhero stuff and superhero shows and movies. And I think part of the reason that I was drawn to it so much was, uh, like longing for good to overtake evil Mm. and longing for someone to come in and save and fix and restore. Um, and I think that's a good longing to have. Um, that, I mean, that does couple with at least what I think from a, from a Christian perspective on what I think God is doing with this world. Um, particularly in Jesus, but, but even through people, But still, I mean, I think there's also this sense that I was drawn to art and music and movies. It said bye-bye. That's what it was doing. Yeah. Um, I suppose it it might be our our cue to to end this, huh? Maybe. Unfortunately. But at the end of it, I would just say, yeah, good and bad can flow out of art, you know, and and it can shape us. It can either awaken good longings or it can can, um, expose maybe our bad longings or our, our, you know, broken inclinations. Yeah, no, it's complex like many things mm-hmm. are. Yeah, mm-hmm. I definitely wanted to talk to you more about some things, but yeah, I guess this is kind of kind of it. 
I was wondering, Books, do you have any closing thoughts? Anything you felt like you wanted to say, you didn't get a chance to? Something on your mind that you wanted to express? Mm. Yeah, I think I think actually something that I'm really encouraged by about you uh, is that I think even with this podcast, your openness to ask people questions and to sincerely uh, dig and think um, and and to be like, I would call what you're doing is being lovingly curious about who people are and what they think. Um, what their life is like. I think that's so important. Um, I think it's important for, I mean, a number of reasons, but uh, our world needs more of it. So I actually just want to say thank you for doing it. Um, but I, I do, I think it's I think it's a model for, um, yeah. I, like, as in, nothing can be, uh, how do I say? Only, only things can be gained from that, not lost. Right. I, I think sometimes we're afraid to uh, ask hard questions. I think sometimes we're afraid to engage with people that we might think are different than us. But in my mind, no, like only can be there's only can be gained from that. Like there's really no loss that can come. So I just I'd wish for more people to do that. And so I hope actually when people engage with what you're putting out, um, they kind of get a. I don't know, like a taste for what you're doing and then they can like play that out with their own um, friends, family, neighbors, whatever, you know, and and I think things will, uh, God will use that in good ways. Yeah, I hope so. And yeah, I like what you said, you know, it's, it's just important to kind of be curious, but like sincerely curious, you know, Mm -hmm. and just to kind of see a person for a person. Yeah. It's what it is. But yeah, I mean, that's that's really it, what it is. I just thank you for the kind words. I appreciate welcome. that. Yeah. 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 You're welcome. Anytime. Well, yeah, well, this was awesome, man. You know, and I'm honestly glad we did this. Yeah, so me too. It was cool. Till next time. Until next time, <laughs> eh? Inshallah. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks a bunch. Yeah. Well, that was Cheers. it. What'd you think? Cool. Great. Love it. <laughs>